Okay, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and start. Uh, let me know if everything works. Not very good at managing this. Okay, yay. Um, so my name is Claire Perella and I will be presenting today the Heart Health Project Making Health Accessible. Um, I'm a current senior at Kepner High School in the JT Mentorship Program, mentoring under Dr. Daniel Wachakor, who's here, um, at the Community Health and Life Center. So to introduce my project, I have to go over the first, first I have to go over these four key topics. Holistic nutrition um, is a relatively recent concept that is starting to be adapted more and more. It's becoming more popular and it's getting the attention it deserves. Um, it's the belief that the food that we put into our bodies is fuel that affects not only our physical health, but our emotional, spiritual, um, and, and, and mental well-being. Um, and cardiovascular disease is a broad term, but it refers to heart conditions um, and health effects on the blood vessels on the heart organ itself, um, which includes, but is not limited to, heart disease, stroke, and hypertension, and then accessibility, which defined as just the term itself, is how easy or obtainable something is. Um, but I'll be talking about it in my project more about the simple and convenient side of it, how to make this information as something that is simple and convenient to implement or to engage with, and then food deserts, um, which is an urban area that doesn't have access to local foods unlike us who have like a k uh like a kepner what a kroger right next to us or an atb or whatever um so holistic nutrition i focus on this in my project to be able to consider um the effects that the food we eat on us how it affects our cardiovascular system um to see to try to diminish that plaque buildup and absorb the nutrients that we need because it tends to get overlooked, especially with all the di American diet and all the processed foods we consume. Um, and accessibility to a healthy lifestyle or to health education is a key topic in my project too, because a lot of people are unaware of the problem that heart um, cardiovascular disease is, especially in America, because it's very easy to obtain this health um, problem based on our current diet and it's something that affects a lot of Americans and it's only on the rise um, and they might not have access to dietitian advice or actual professional medic uh, medical professional advice which I was able to give them by consulting with my mentor and you know they might not have the ability to find the steps that they need to have a healthy lifestyle because they're unaware or because it's overwhelming. There's a lot of information on the internet that's very confusing to them. There's fad diets that they hear about, you know, juice cleanses, and they think that this is, you know, the only way to go about certain things. So I wanted to um, present them this healthy information in a way that was easy to digest, something not to be overwhelmed or um, to be scared by, but something that can be seen as accessible, easy to implement into their life. Um, and so to do this, I had to consider how to present it first off. First off I was thinking between the slideshows or um, just a little pamphlet, but I decided on a brochure. I actually have two of them with me today. Um, my mentor hasn't seen them yet, but I'll show him today. <laughs> um, so I decided this one because it would be more convenient for Dr. Wachakor to incorporate it into his office since he already has um, pamphlets in it that his patients are used to picking up. And because it's just a really easy way to provide condensed information. And, you know, I can guarantee that they'll pick it up or read it while reading in the, um, that while waiting in the reading room, you know, however bored they might be. And then so we had to discuss what should I put in it. And I chose heart healthy, like heart health problems since it's such a big problem in America. But I was actually bouncing around ideas from veganism, the Mediterranean diet, prenatal nutrition. But I thought this would be the one that pertains to most of the clientele that walks into his office. And so um, I decided to present to them the 10 
things that they must have in their kitchen for a heart healthy diet. And after a lot of research, a lot of different articles and debates with Dr. Wachakor, I was able to, to decide on 10 foods that I'll show you later. And I also included a description of what a heart healthy diet is and why it is, it is important in this day and age. Um, because, you know, as I said before, they might not have access to health education or they might be completely unaware of this problem and to make it more accessible, not only to English speakers, but since we live in Houston, which has such a high concentration of Hispanic population, I made a copy in Spanish and in my website too for Spanish speakers with this goal that I mentioned before of making health information accessible to the public. And so I was able to do that thankfully because I come from a bilingual household um, and then I wanted to make sure that they interacted with the pamphlet. And so again, starting from the beginning, we were like, okay, we'll put the survey on the pamphlet and then we'll ask them to email me or to text me. But it just was too many steps for them to follow, or at least in my opinion, I thought they wouldn't engage because it wasn't put forth in a simple, effective way. So we decided, well, Yes, we decided to make a link to a website and I used a QR code so they wouldn't have to go through the hassle of typing in my URL and they would just have to click and scan it and they would be directed to my survey right away without having to put in more effort. And in this survey, I asked them questions to kind of calculate how the effect of my pamphlet, if they were able to gain confidence in the health education, if they were able to implement the suggested tips that I included. Um, and I even put a link to recipes that included the foods that I listed, just in case that it was outside of their comfort zone to be able to encourage them to in include them because there are foods like whole grain oats or oatmeal and I know a lot of people find it kind of disgusting or bland so I found recipes that showed it as a more fun and easy way to incorporate them into their diet so that health, healthy eating could be seen as something exciting rather than restrictive which is another problem that we face as a public because a lot of people um, associate healthy eating with limiting themselves and it can end up taking a negative toll in an opposite way. Um, and so, and then I had to consider the colors, sorry. <laughs> I'm like getting ahead of myself. Um, I had to consider the colors and I did not know that this was a thing, but I had a discussion with my mentor, Dr. Wachokor, about how he even had to like pay someone for advice when coloring the rooms of his office. And so I wanted something that was calming, but also that drew attention. So at first I chose a stormy gray and a bunch of bright colors so I could grab their attention, but it got rejected at the print shop because it was too distracting. And then, so I had to research the psychology of colors to make sure that the color I chose was relating to the message that I wanted to get across. And so I settled on the color green. And I chose this color because of the psychology behind it. It's synonymous with health. If you, I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of healthy food brands have the color green, such as Whole Foods, or their organic logo is green, and Simple Truths, which is a vegan brand. So I don't know if many of you know it. Um, but it, a lot of people equate the color green, as I've seen from surveys and stuff. They equate it with hope, freshness, growth, and prosperity. And there is a primitive relationship between humans and the color green because it's um, it means life because they think of plants, you know, leaves, grass. And so this was the message that I wanted to relay with my information. I wanted it to be seen as something healthy, something prosperous and positive, you know? And this is my resulting brochure. Um, I made sure I put a disclaimer because I didn't want them to replace this information for meeting with a medical professional. professional. And this is a top 10 heart healthy foods. So I settled with whole grain oats, salmon, nuts, garbanzo beans, chia and flax seeds, green leafy veggies, legumes, low fat dairy, olive oil, and turkey, all because they, they um, offer different nutrients that is important for a heart healthy diet, such as omega-3 fatty acids, fiber, and tox antioxidants, protein, and cholesterol free to minimize plaque buildup. 
And um, the lifestyle tips I forgot to talk about, but this was actually Dr. Wachiko's idea to incorporate because although nutrition is very important in your health, it can't be the only thing you change. We have to be more active, which is hard because a lot of Americans who work, you know, a nine to five job have a very sedentary lifestyle and especially with COVID since we've all been trapped in our homes. Um, but I was, so this compelled me to include this section to help them recognize the points in their life that they need to improve on or to need to incorporate activities, you know, their sleep schedules. I think this one gets very overlooked, especially in teenager years and stress and the daily water usage. And actually, wait, sorry. Here, I was gonna show you my website. So this is, sorry. This is the survey. So um, we ended up only doing like five or six questions because again, I didn't want them to get overwhelmed or discouraged to participate if it was just too much. So the first question was very point blank. Um, do you know what a heart healthy diet is? We chose this one because if they said no, then I failed and I need to improve my pamphlet. But if they said yes, I know at least the first step of my mission was completed. And if the brochure was easy to understand, and I left a suggestion box just in case they found it difficult to understand or difficult to incorporate so that I can pick up this project, you know, beyond this mentorship and learn where I was weak and improve for the health of the public. And were they able to implement the foods? Again, if they weren't able to, they, were, they could leave a suggestion box comment and I would improve on it. Um, the how healthy do you consider yourself? We decided to see this as a starting point, and I guess, well, I want to go back sometime and see where they are after incorporating all this and see if, if they experience any growth. Um, how often do you get a health checkup? This is related to the last one because you need to check up on yourself and be self-aware to be able to improve. And please state your level of agreement to the statement food is medicine so that's the overall theme of my project because as I said with holistic nutrition um, it affects us in more ways than one so to realize this we can start using it as a tool and a lot of people tend to overlook it so successes in the field there have been many but of course because of time I was limited so I'm going to focus on these two um one of the greatest successes in the field of nutrition, arguably, I guess you could say, is the folic acid versus spina bifida, spina bifida um, discovery. Um, spina bifida is a birth defect when the child's spinal cord doesn't develop fully or properly in the womb. And so they started doing trials to see how they could stop this because it was the most common womb of norm, um, abnormally, sorry. Um, and so they started doing, you know, clinical trials, observations, studying epidemiology and biochemistry, and they concluded that it was folic acid. And then it also disproved the dogma that our balanced diet contained all the nutrients that we needed for, you know, healthy, um, healthy procreation. And so now there's been more and more funding to continue to include this or more research and ways to include this earlier in life, but um, it's also incorporated in prenatal vitamins. So a lot of people who find out they're pregnant start to take it to ensure the health of their baby. Um, and the next one I'll talk about is the health effects of trans fatty acids. So this one is going on, receiving a lot of heat right now because they discovered that trans fatty acids um, affects the blood lip lipoproteins which raises your bad cholesterol and lowers your good one which then leads to plaque buildup which then leads to cardiovascular diseases such as a stroke or a heart attack um, and so since 2006 there's been an influx in investments to research or ways to take this off of the market because it's in a lot of processed foods that we're presented with today in grocery stores and so they want to take this out of the American diet completely because um, of the effect it has on our heart health and how we're going to see the effects soon of people who grew up eating this rather than people who are exposed to it later in life um, so I'm hopeful <laughs> And current research that's being done um, in the theme of accessibility, I chose accessibility in Malaysia because of 
the fact that it's a food desert, as I mentioned before, an area that doesn't have access to local foods or to nutritional services. Um, so right now it's going through um, a discrepancy in dietitian services, especially in outpatient hemodialysis, which is a treatment that filters waste and waters, water from your blood. Um, which is what your kidneys are supposed to do. So this treatment is for people who have experienced kidney failure. And they it's a very delicate procedure and it has to be taken with great caution. And it needs, it calls for dietitian nutritional care and attention, but these patients in Malaysia are without it. So there have been um, calls for funding and investments to be able to provide them this dietitian care so they won't have to suffer more. And the next one is COVID and nutrition, which is obviously still being um, still being changed <laughs> every single day as we continue to go throughout this pandemic because nothing is guaranteed tomorrow. A whole different thing can be true. Um, but they do uh, have some recommended uh, vitamins and supplements to take. Not that any would prevent the virus itself, but it will help your body beat it or help you strengthen your immune system, especially because um, there's been like this these fad diets going around that say they cure COVID, like melting an orange, like burning it and then eating it with brown sugar. Um, so doctors have been in research have been saying to avoid the fad diets and to you know, take your vitamin C, which is an antioxidant, which promotes a healthier immune system, melatonin, because it promotes sleep and your body recovers in its sleep, and zinc, because um, it has been linked to antiviral activity. They also suggest eating anti-inflammatory foods such as apples, berries, cherries, um, yogurt, and kombucha for your probiotics, and chia seeds and salmon for omega-3 fatty acids. future projections. So I think there will be um, in the future, it's looking pretty hopeful. As I said, um, holistic nutrition is getting a lot more attention, becoming more popular. So I believe that there will be healthier fast food options. We're already starting to see it, like the Impossible Whopper, which is a black bean burger at Burger King, and um, the grilled Chick-fil-A nuggets at Chick-fil-A. Um, and so it gives me hope because they're making healthy fast food options just as accessible and easier to obtain as the unhealthy options that we are so prone to getting because it's so easy to spend drop five dollars on a happy meal or something then it takes the you know going to the grocery store and finding the right lettuce or seasoning that you want to make a healthy salad with I believe that since America has this culture of eating out all the time and especially fast food that if we are presented with healthier fast food options, we'll be able to combat obesity. Um, I think awareness through media and technology is included in the future projections because we are growing up in this tech day and age, especially during this pandemic where everything's moved into the virtual world. And they are brought a lot of attention to things that we might not have been aware of in the industry before, such as the chicken documentary by Morgan Spurlock. He highlighted the how much they're how many how much they pump into the chickens, the growth hormones, how high the demand is, even though it's not necessary and it's never been this high before. And the Sea Spiracy documentary on Netflix, the highlights that kind of debunks the the widely accepted belief that seafood is always the healthier option. And with stuff like this, I believe that in the problems of the food industry are being highlighted and it allows me to hope for a better tomorrow because once these problems are brought to our attention, I believe as the public that is becoming more and more aware that we'll, draw, we'll work to make it better. And I believe access to dietitians is only going up in HEB and our, and our local HEB, they have started um, having a dietitian there for their customers that accepts over 70 different kinds of insurances to make sure they have this service. At universities, they have dietitian or nutritionists on campus to talk to the students to make sure that they're getting all the nutrients during this time. And I believe that there's just a more interest in nutrition and that the stu students taking these classes are going up so that there'll be more nutritionists or dietitians in the future to be able to help people. Uh, where do I fit in? So my academic career, I see this 
um, I learned from this project a lot, especially in technology and making my website and the pamphlet and in research because I was presented with so many articles, but I was able to do my own literary analysis to be able to debate with my um, mentor to come into a conclusion and to see how this curiosity of mine was only further fueled. And I think I will continue to have in my academic career. In my professional career, I will be taking an emphasis on medicinal nutrition. Although I'm not sure that being a dietitian is what I want to do anymore. I do believe to, that there is um, medicinal benefits of nutrition and I want to become a therapist for children with autism. And I believe that nutrition will, um, develop a new solution or a new way to treat the condition to help them become more dependent, independent individuals and to help them be their healthiest selves. And um, that's it. But I would like to say a special thank you to my mentor, Dr. Dr. Daniel Wachikor, who was so accommodating and patient and understanding with me because I've had breakdowns with him. And yet he was always able to calm me down and help me gain confidence. And he was always feeding my curiosity. He never dismissed a question, even if it was a dumb one. And to my teacher, Mrs. Bryant, who was also so inspiring and so kind and who hugged me every time I had to meet her in person, even though there's COVID. And with that, I'd like to say at the end. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hey, Clara, I, sorry I came in a little bit late, but uh, did your study ever consider the uh work-life balance of adult or even kids, right? Uh, even studied life balance. Mm -hmm. uh, so, because what happened is that uh, when you don't, um, I guess have work-life balance, you work late and you grab the fastest uh, thing there is out there is called fast food, mm -hmm. just to, to, to eat, right? Or if the kids uh, you know, don't have time to actually sit down and properly eat, then they grab the next best thing there is, which is again, fast food or anything that's unhealthy. So yeah. that might be interesting to, to see whether or not that uh, in itself added to uh, the, the, the problem that uh, the growing problem of uh, unhealthy uh, conditions. Mm 